Ma'am, as she teaches the word of God to each one of us in the class, Lord, I thank you for the grace which you have empowered her to teach us, Lord, this morning, and also bless each one of our, our classmates so that our hearts will be ready to receive what our teacher has to teach us this morning, Lord God. Bless us, Lord. Help us to be uh, alert uh, and also teach us Holy Spirit throughout the class, Lord. We commit our life into your hand. Into your hand. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for that meaningful prayer. Yes, we will begin. Um, so uh, sorry about last uh, week. I could not attend. Uh, but yeah, the week before that, we were looking at Philippians. So what exactly have we you know, um, looked at in the letter to the Philippians so far? Um, in the first chapter, Philippian, uh, he praises these, um, uh, Paul praises the Philippian believers uh, because they have partnered with him in the gospel, making sacrifices, being willing to share in this work of ministry. So he's grateful to them. And around the end of the uh, of chapter one, he says, you know, uh, live in a way that is worthy of this gospel of Christ. So even as you people are partnering with me in this sharing this gospel, live a life that is worthy of this gospel is what he says. And so in, sec in chapter two, he starts off by explaining what he means uh, by this living a life that is worthy of the gospel. How does one live out a life like that? What exactly would it mean? Uh, so he explains having the mind of Christ Jesus uh, who came to the earth to serve and not to be served. So um, we need to have that same um, attitude and then we will be able to live in a way that is worthy of this gospel. So he says that when we do this, we are like lights shining in a dark world, um, you know, and uh, he gives two examples of people who have this mind of Christ. He talks about Timothy. He says, I have no one else like Timothy uh, who is genuinely concerned about your interests, he says. And he also speaks of Epaphroditus, who was willing to even, you know, neglect his health and stay on in Rome for the sake of Paul. So he mentions these people who seem to be having the mind of Christ. After having spoken about these things, um, he uh, we enter into chapter 3, where uh, we see that uh, he starts talking about this danger of Judaizers, which may arise in the Philippian church. Uh, these people have been moving from church to church, uh, spreading their false teachings, and he is concerned uh, that the Philippians also may be attacked in a similar manner. So he starts off chapter 3 by saying, I have already talked to you about this and I'm repeating it again. Uh, so which means he is anticipating this danger. He has warned them about these Judaizers earlier and he wants to warn them uh, a second time. So in these first three verses, which we covered last week, first three verses of chapter 3, um, he talks about how these people, uh, they think that they are the circumcised. But he says, uh, he uses two very, very strong terms, very negative derogatory terms to talk about them. He says these people are not the circumcised. In fact, they are dogs because the Jewish people looked down on dogs as being something very, uh, um, uh, very low. And he also says, "You are. this is not circumcision. This is not holy and sacred uh, circumcision. This is just mutilation of the flesh. So he uses this very two, uh, this two very strong terms uh, to denounce their uh, support of the Mosaic law and the circumcision ceremony and all of that. And he says, it's we who are boasting in Christ Jesus and not in works. We are the true circumcised is what he says. Um, so after having talked about that in these in three verses, uh, he moves into the fourth verse where he talks a little bit about his background and how if we really are meant to be placing confidence for our salvation in the um, in works and in the Mosaic law, then in fact he should be able to you know, boast more confidently than all of us regarding his salvation, if at all salvation can be achieved by, you know, through the Mosaic law and circumcision. So verse four onwards, he's talking about himself. He's talking about um, how superior he is even to the Judaizers 
you know, if you were to uh, compare him with the Judaizers with regard to the Mosaic law and all of that. And he says, knowing what a high uh, status these people place on such things, you know, such as circumcision and Mosaic laws and all that, he says, this is the way I look at these things. They regard these things as something of high status, but this is the way I look at these things. So we will be looking at uh, a little bit at details uh, regarding these things. So uh, if we could have someone uh, read out for us uh, from verse four, uh, yet um, yeah, from verse four up to verse six, uh, Philippians chapter three, verses four to six. If someone could read out for us, please. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law blameless yes so um if at all we actually can have confidence in uh, the mosaic law and in the rituals then i would be the most confident is basically what he is saying about himself because when it came to uh, uh, the things which the judaizers regarded as important for salvation paul you know had 100 on 100 in, in all of those areas. So he talks about it. He says, on the eighth day, exactly according to the Mosaic law, I was circumcised. You know, I was uh, that ceremony which makes me a part of the people of God that was done on the eighth day itself, he says. Uh, and he says, uh, and I'm not just someone who's being circumcised from another nation. I'm not a Gentile who's getting circumcised. I am a uh, Israelite, one of the people of Israel, and not just any Israelite. I am from the tribe of Benjamin, which you know uh, the Benjamites regarded themselves as Hebrew of the Hebrews. Why? Simply because um, the the portion of land that was given to the tribe of Benjamin, Jerusalem lies within the you know, within the borders of that uh, of that portion of land. So the Benjamites always considered themselves as extra special because uh, the temple of God was literally in their portion of territory. So they would you know, regard themselves as the Hebrew of the Hebrews. So he says, that is who I am, in case you're you know, asking for my background. But when it comes to keeping the law, I never, keep the, I, mean, I never used to keep the law like some average person. I used to keep the law the way Pharisees keep it. You know, they literally type uh, right down to the last grain. Uh, they are, so when it came to keeping the law, I was keeping it the way the Pharisees keep it, you know, with uh, looking into every minute detail uh, as far as outward customs go. Um, you know, as for inward change, that's something that only the Holy Spirit can do. So, yeah, that he did not have at that point of time. And he says, when it came to matters of zeal, he says, I was so zealous that even though I had my own job, I had my own career, I laid all that aside. I literally went from town to town persecuting these Christians because I believed that the Jewish faith is you know, is true. So he says, when it comes to zeal, I went to that extent of actually persecuting the church. And then he comes to this last claim that he makes about uh, himself. He says, when it came to righteousness based on the law, he says, I was faultless. I mean, that's quite a statement to make. He's writing at a point of time when many of his contemporaries are still alive. You know, all, all the other Pharisees with whom he used to rub shoulders, they are there. In case he was bluffing about this particular aspect, they would have pointed it out to him and said, huh, you know, um, uh, what are you saying? I mean, we know what faults you had. We know in all the ways that you compromised. Uh, you know, they could easily have said that. And that would have completely, um, uh, you know, corrupted his credibility. Nobody would even believe in him anymore. That he could openly make a statement like this proves that he kept it so faultlessly that nobody would be able to lift a finger against him and say, uh, no, he, you know, he compromised in this area, he compromised in this area. So as far as righteousness based on the law is concerned, outwardly, whatever he could do, 
that poor man had done it all. I mean, like to the best of his ability, which is why in Romans chapter seven, he agonizes over what he is on the inside. What a contrast on the outside is somebody who is admired by people, but on the inside, so many wrong attitudes, so much sin. And he, you know, he, he talks about the struggle that he went through until Christ came along and delivered him. Uh, so that was the inside story that he was undergoing. But when it came to outward things, he says, if this is what we should be placing our confidence in for salvation, I, in fact, should be the most confident. But I am plainly telling you people and the Judaizers that this will take us nowhere near heaven. So he says, what we need to be boasting in is being in Christ. Christ should be our boast. Uh, so he brings out uh, the importance of believing in Christ. And he talks about the entire irrelevance of all these great things which the Judaizers you know, are placing um, as a high on the list. Uh, I mean, being circumcised, being a Hebrew of the Hebrews, being a Pharisee, being someone who is actually willing to go and persecute the Christians and take action against them. All these things completely irrelevant when it comes to gaining salvation. So he makes this point to show them that if they place any confidence at all in these things, they are going to be in for a very, very nasty surprise because he who should be far more confident than them regarding these things, he has understood how useless these things are. So he's trying to tell these Philippians, when these teachers come to you and start telling you these things, let your boast be in Christ alone. You know, so he, he wants to make that very, very clear to them, which is why he goes on to talk about uh, what his stand is regarding these things. Verse 7 onwards, he speaks about it. Um, if we could have someone read out for us all the way from verse 7 up to verse 11, please. Uh, Philippians 3, 7 to 11. Yeah, if someone could read out Philippians 3, uh, 7 to 11. Uh, yeah, those of you who know how to not have a Bible in front of you, this is a classroom setting, even though you're doing it from your homes. Uh, so, you know, please do have an open Bible in front of you. Uh, and yeah, if any one of you could please just unmute and read out Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 to 11. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 to 11. But what things were again to me, this I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is true faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Yes. So here he says, these things which I have mentioned just now, these were all gains. You know, there was something that I could be um, uh, very proud about. Uh, these were his badges of honor, you know, the all these uh, uh, merits that he had, being a Pharisee, uh, being uh, very uh, meticulous in keeping the law. All these were badges of honor, which he, which he carried with great pride earlier. But now when he looks at those things, he says, I just consider them as a loss. I mean, I'm willing to just fling them away for the sake of Christ, he says. And in the next sentence, he repeats that again in verse 8. He says, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus. Because the only way he can know Christ Jesus personally and have a relationship with this Jesus, who will one day take him to heaven and give him a resurrected body, 
uh, for all of this to happen, he has to put away these other badges of honor. If he holds on to those, he cannot know Christ. So he understands that, that knowing Christ is of surpassing worth, more worthy than anything else. So because of that, he is willing to throw aside, consider these badges of honor as nothing but a loss. You know, he spent so many years of his life investing into these things, but now he just has to regard them as a loss. I mean, all that many years wasted, you know, and uh, move on. So he has understood that. So he says, that's the way you, you know, that's, that's what he's trying to convey to the Philippian believers. You too should regard, uh, um, you know, this, the Mosaic law in this manner. If any of you are from a Jewish background, if any of you have been striving, you know, to, uh, to grow closer to God by doing these things, now you just have to consider all the investment that you put in as a loss and move on because these things will do nothing for you. They will in no way help you to get to know Christ. Uh, so, uh, you know, and he had uh, made this point earlier in Galatians where he spent a lot of time talking about this aspect because uh, in the Galatian church, those people were already um, gaining control and were creating havoc. So at that time, uh, he in fact expresses the same thought even in, uh, in, in, in the letter to the Galatians. You know, let's look at that because over there he talks about how um, if you want to know Christ, uh, it's vital to move away from the Mosaic law. So if we could have, uh, you know, someone read out for us Galatians chapter 5 verses 2 to 4, uh, because over there it's more clearly ex you know, explained how um, for the sake of Christ, you know, you gain Christ by giving up these things. So Galatians 5, 2 to 4, if we could have someone read out, please. Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 to 4. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. Mm -hmm. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he is the debtor to keep the whole law. You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. So very we, serious things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. So the, the things he's mentioning here are extremely serious. If you're hold, going to hold on to the Mosaic law, Christ is of no profit to you. I mean, they, you, you'll gain nothing from the work of, uh, of, of Christ on the cross. You know, so that will be of no benefit to you if you hold on to the law. In fact, you become estranged, alienated from Christ. So you will never know Christ personally, and he will never take you to heaven with him. So uh, it's a very dangerous thing. He says, you, you, if you hold on to the law, you fall away from grace. So therefore, having understood these truths, now in the Philippian letter, he says in Philippians 3 verse 7, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Because he has understood that if he is to get this surpassing, you know, valuable treasure of knowing Christ Jesus, he has to give, you know, just accept all that he has spent his entire lifetime on as a loss, give it up, leave it behind, and move on. So uh, a term that he uses in verse 8 to talk about these badges of honor, which the Judaizers regarded as something so valuable, he says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Um, that word that is used over there, uh, it's actually a combination of two Greek words. Uh, it's the word skybalon. Uh, the first word, the first part of Skybalon talks about dogs. The second, uh, you know, portion of that word, uh, it's based on the Greek word balon, which means to throw. So actually, that word Skybalon is basically the scraps, you know, the food scraps and the vegetable scraps and stuff which uh, get left over after you finish your meal, after you finish your cooking, and you throw it to the stray dogs. So. He is taking something which the Judaizers value a lot, and he's saying, you know what this what this is fit for? This is something that you just throw to the dogs. And in their opinion, the dogs were something of very, very low value. So he's making a very snide remark, you know, about uh, uh, these badges of honor, which they regard in such high esteem. So he says to me, they are nothing but, um, you know, uh, sky balloon. Now, um, 
there are some ancient writings where the word sky balloon is also used for uh, animal excreta you know like the dung of the donkeys as they are going down the road um, you know other animal waste uh, so um, in some translations english translations you'll have the word dung being mentioned uh, but sky balloon literally is talking about the scraps which you throw away to the uh, dogs so he says that i may gain christ i have decided i'll consider all these honors as garbage and leave them behind me uh, so he says i want to know christ this is something that i want and in what way does he want to know christ he says he wants to know the power of christ's resurrection and he wants to participate in christ's sufferings becoming like him in his death so you know this is something that we need to um, kind of reflect upon we all want to know christ and yes how do we want to know christ we definitely want to know the power of his resurrection we want to see his resurrection power displayed in all areas of our life of our ministry we would very much love to know christ in that way but there are two aspects to knowing christ yes you need to know the power of his resurrection make it something very personal which you know uh, you're walking in on a daily basis but there's another aspect you also need to be participating in his sufferings on a daily basis you know uh, people will oppose us when we take a stand for christ the same way christ was opposed in his day when he took a stand for the heavenly father so uh, we would have to also participate in the sufferings of christ and uh, become like him in his death in what way did christ you know die he humbled himself he talked you know paul has already talked about this in chapter 2 so christ went to the extent of humbling himself uh to the extent of you know being uh, of of, of uh, allowing himself to be hung on a cross naked humiliated you know by with people passing comments on him even as people are passing by he allowed himself to be reduced to that stage so that he may serve so he uh, paul has understood what it is to know christ yes he wants to know the power of christ's resurrection and he also wants to fully participate in the sufferings of christ and why is he willing to go to all of these efforts It's because one day jesus has promised that he is going to resurrect him from the dead he is going to have a resurrected body in heaven just the way jesus has a resurrected body this is what he is looking forward to you know with eager anticipation and so he repeats this thought in the uh, in, in the next uh, verses um yeah it may be we could have someone read out for us verses 12 to um uh, 17 yeah all the way from uh, verse 12 to verse 17 philippians chapter 3 yeah someone could read out please as is well not that i have already attained or am already perfected but i press on that i may lay hold of that for which christ jesus has also laid hold of me brethren i do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing i do forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead i press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of god in christ jesus therefore so, let us as sorry continue verse 14 man yeah, yeah please continue yes i read up, up to 14 okay fine we'll stop at this point and we will look at what is being said uh, yeah then maybe we can take the next chunk uh, so yes uh, so here um, he says it's true that i have not already you know um, received a resurrected body it's true that i uh, you know have not already Re- uh, received my heavenly reward so he says not that i have already obtained all this but i press on to take hold of that for which christ jesus took hold of me so when jesus jesus christ he looked at me and he made up you know in in his mind he decided that this is one guy you know that i am going to take under my wings and one day i will reward him and he is going to have a resurrected body so jesus looked at him and wanted this for him so he says this is what jesus christ took hold of me for 
and no way am I going to miss out on this. So I am going to press on and know him in his resurrection power, know him in his sufferings. I, I want to know him um, in, in all of these aspects. Uh, why? So that, you know, he says in verse 14, so that I may win the prize for which God has called me heavenward. Because in heaven, there is an eternal reward awaiting him. And in heaven, he is going to be, uh, you know, have a resurrected body. And this is uh, important to him. So he's striving towards that. Therefore, he says in verse 13, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Now, when Paul is using this term over here, forgetting what is behind, he's thinking about the entire lifetime of effort that he put into the Jewish faith. All the things that he did so carefully in such a disciplined manner, all that is now just waste. It is of no value. So it's all right. You know, he's willing to just put it all behind him and start afresh and strain forward towards what Jesus is offering. So he's every day he's willing to learn how to walk in the resurrection power of Christ. Every day he's willing to make the sacrifices required to be like Jesus, you know, to become like him in his death. So he's willing to do this. So he's left the past behind. You know, uh, we, of course, did not spend our whole lives being Pharisees and uh, you know training ourselves in the law of Moses. But then we may have our own badges of honor. You know, we, we, may have, we might have been good people um, who tried to live a good life. Um, and people uh, looked up to us. People respected us. We were not like those um, you know rebels who uh, get into uh, drunkenness and uh, uh, you know speaking uh, bad things about people and being destructive we were not like that you know we were good people people respected us for good things about us but if we continue to look to those things and say ah, i'm doing all right you know we will miss out on this prize for which god has called us so it's not enough that people think well of us it's not enough that you know we might have um, had some successes in our Christian walk. Uh, forgetting all of those things, there are greater things to move on to. There is, uh, there, there is more that we need to do to walk in the resurrection power of Christ. There's far more that we need to do to become like him in his death. Many more sacrifices that need to be made. A lot of, you know, um, honing and molding that we need to do regarding our character, getting rid of all those extra things uh, that are, uh, you know, um, like blemishes on, you know, on who we are and getting rid of those things that we, we start becoming more and more like him. So there's a lot more to strain forward toward. So if we are people who are complacent, happy with whatever we have achieved so far, and we just sit on our, on our laurels, there's a danger that we will forget to strain forward and become what Christ is urging us to become. So we must not be self-satisfied people. We choose to forget whatever badges of honor we might have earned in the past, and we move on into greater revelations of the resurrection power of God and how to walk in it. We move on into carrying the cross more and more. You know, we, because Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to take up your cross on a daily basis, make those sacrifices, you know, um, set yourself apart from me, uh, give up all the things which dishonor me. Those are things that you need to do if you want to be my disciple. So, so we need to work towards those things. And uh, so having talked about these things, Paul urges the Philippians and he says, join together in following my example. This is how I am walking on a daily basis, not just walking in resurrection path, but also walking in the sufferings and sacrifices of Christ. Please follow my example in this, he says, because these Judaizers who are going to come, are going to use big words and they will impress you. But what are they actually? What is their attitude actually? He talks about the kind of people that they really, in reality, they are, you know, what, what they actually are. Uh, so, um, yes, if you could have someone read out for us verses 17 to 21, 17 to 21. Verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and note 
those who so walk as you have us for a pattern for many walk of whom i have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of christ whose end is destruction whose god is their belly and whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things for our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the savior the lord jesus christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be con conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself Amen. yes so he says there are two kinds of persons you know that you can model yourself after you can be like me and the others who are you know uh, like me in their values he says just as you have us as a model keep your eyes on those who live as we do so there are people who are trying to um, know christ in his resurrection power and also know christ in his sufferings and sacrifices so choose to follow that example he says don't follow the example of this other category this judaizers he says they are actually enemies of the cross because for them what is all, what is important is their stomach their god is their stomach uh, you know so in um, in the sense of their value is placed on material things that's what they really value that's what they worship so it doesn't literally mean only food it's uh, talking in a larger sense about uh, material things temporary things things which satisfy the senses you know you just want to please your five senses whatever will make you feel good rather than uh, following christ so they uh, so they would rather go you know they would rather have salvation through circumcision because then circumcision will not involve all this extra efforts of carrying your cross daily and making sacrifices you know you just need to undergo that uh, that ceremony as a baby and you're done so they would prefer to follow that other route only thing that route will not lead to uh, heaven uh, so he says don't imitate them because their god is their stomach um, and uh, their glory is in their shame their mind is set on earthly things but then we are not earthly he says our citizenship is in heaven we've been made citizens now christ is going to come one day and collect us and take us there so that you know we can enjoy our citizenship in his kingdom so um, and in fact he says on that day our lowly bodies will be will become like his body the same way he has a resurrection body we will also have a similar resurrection body so he is look he says let us look forward to these things so he says imitate me and people who are having my values rather than imitating these uh, judaizers so on that note uh, you know we uh, we end chapter 3 let's quickly move into chapter 4 um so we will not uh, dwell much on the eodia and sentite uh, passage because we already looked at that uh, last uh, you know the week before that yeah we already looked at it um so if uh, but we will look at all the other verses which are there and in fact this particular <laughs> uh passage is highly familiar because every christian you know turns to this passage for strength uh for um, holding on to god in times of difficulty so it's a highly familiar passage and there are so many uh, things that we can you know take away from here uh so um in uh, philippians chapter 4 if maybe we could have someone read out for us the first seven verses yes philippians 4 uh, 1 to 7 Philippians 4 verses 1 to 7 Therefore my beloved and longed for brethren my joy and my and crown so stand fast in the Lord beloved be united joyful and in prayer I implore you dear and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord and I urge you also true companion help these women who labored with me in the gospel with clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life rejoice in the lord always again i say again i will say rejoice let your gentleness be known to all men 
the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes. So after having talked about uh, how we should place our eyes on Christ, how we should place our hope in Christ, he says, remember, you know, so Christ is our only hope. So stand firm in the Lord in this way, he says. Um, and then he moves on to the next topic that he wants to talk about, where he brings up this issue of these two leaders who are probably very prominent leaders because uh, their disagreement you know, uh, can actually harm the church itself, the unity of the church. So, which is probably why he's addressing this um, this particular issue. You know, you know, in a public letter. And uh, so, we we talked about the details of this. He's basically requesting them uh, to have the same mind. It's true that they, you know, they have different opinions, differing opinions regarding some matter. Uh, but he says, you know, for the sake of the church, um, you know, let them. Um, let them have the same mind in the Lord. Uh, so after having talked about that, uh, the next sentence, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And then in the next verse, it says, let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. So these things which he is saying, he is continuing you know, in his talk, regarding Iodhya and Syntyche. So it's not like as if, you know, the at verse 3, the uh, issue of these two women just gets cut off, and then he's moving on to a new topic in uh, verse 4. It's, a, it's actually a, a continuation of thought. Um, so after having said, you know, um, that we should our focus should be on Christ, he says, let us stand firm in the Lord in this way. And he immediately refers to two women, who are kind of getting a little shaky they're not standing firm in the lord in this way so he raises this issue and he says please be united in your thinking uh, because you know this is important for the sake of the gospel uh, you know you have fought along with me so now don't step away continue to remain firm he says and how do they remain firm he says rejoice in the lord always i will say it again rejoice you know so here is not talking about just positive thinking. I mean, no, there's a lot of talk about positive thinking nowadays. Uh, we are not supposed to look at the dark cloud. We're supposed to look at the silver lining, which is there at the edges of the dark cloud. And that's what positive thinking would say. But here is not urging these two women to just hold on to some silver lining, hoping that some silver lining comes along. No, he is asking them to rejoice in the Lord. You see, the Lord knows. Uh, what each of them desires. They both have some, you know, differing opinions regarding something. And uh, the Lord knows about uh, both sides of the argument. Uh, he cares about the opinions of both of these people. He cares about their interests. So therefore, if they can just lay this matter in his hands and follow his leading, they can truly rejoice. So there's no need to get all grumpy and get all you know troubled and disturbed and uh, and, and wonder oh you know uh, who's going to have to give in to the other one. You know, no need to go into all of those you know complications. Have an attitude of rejoicing in the Lord because the Lord He will sort it out. He will guide both of them. He will tell them what steps they should take you know in resolving this issue. So let them be of the same mind in the Lord. Let the Lord guide this matter. Let the Lord you know, uh, show them what needs to be done. So don't be grumpy and very disturbed and unhappy about what has happened. Yes, differences will arise, but continue to rejoice in the Lord. You know, leave it in the Lord's hands. He knows how to, how to resolve this. So in the next verse, he says, let your gentleness be evident to all. So in this disagreement that you're going through right now, Continue to stay gentle. Continue to stay loving. Don't get bitter. Don't uh, develop grudges against each other. Don't try to start competing with each other and try to pull, you know, half the church to your side, uh, even if the other uh, the other half of the church goes to the others other person's side. Don't indulge in all of that. He says, 
let your gentleness be evident to all why because the lord is near you know this um, what he is saying here may not be very clear to us but james talks about the same thing in his letter and over there he connects this whole idea of being gentle and you know uh, uh, bearing with one another in love he connects it to the idea of the lord is near so let's actually look at that passage to understand uh, this passage better okay so if somebody could go to james chapter 5 verses 7 to 11 we will see the connection very clearly over there uh, james chapter 5 verses 7 to 11 please therefore be patient brethren until the coming of the lord see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain you also be patient establish your hearts for the coming of the lord is at hand do not grumble against one another brethren lest you be condemned behold the judge is standing at the door and then 10 and 11 my brethren take the prophet who spoke in the name of the lord as an example of suffering and patience indeed we count them blessed who endure you have heard of the perseverance of job and seen the end intended by the lord that the lord is very compassionate and merciful okay so in in this james passage uh, it there's more clarity on this whole idea of let your gentleness be evident to all the lord is near Okay, so it's like as if it's like more. It's like it's a more elaborate exp, uh, explanation, you can say almost, of this uh, Philippian uh, instruction. Um, in James, uh, in the James passage, he is talking about how the coming of the Lord is very, very near. So he says, you know, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. the judge is literally standing at the door like is is that close is near so be very careful he says brothers and sisters as an example of patience in the face of suffering take the prophets who spoke in the name of the lord you know uh, these prophets they did not grumble and one example he uses of one particular person job so when when uh, job's friends spoke against him Yes, it's actually true. When you look at the book of Job, he does grumble against them. But then, at the end of it all, you know, he is willing to forgive them, and he makes an offering, a sacrifice on their behalf. Okay, so uh, Job chooses to respond with love and gentleness at the end of the whole story. You know, rather than continuing to hold a grudge against them, and because he takes that attitude, what's the result? Oh, you know, it says in verse eleven, James five eleven, it says, "You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about." You know, the Lord brought about a very good result for him, and the Lord will do the very same thing for Eodia and Sintaik if they can just, you know, uh, have the same mind and maintain unity for the sake of the church. If they can continue to remain standing firm in the Lord rather than being. Uh, no um led away by bitterness and grudges and all of that uh, so he says you know uh, oh, in this james passage you know he's of course talking to a different audience but he says look at the outcome of the of the way job responded the lord was full of compassion and mercy towards him the end result was really good for job so we could you know actually apply that uh, in in our philippian passage where uh, paul is instructing and saying let your gentleness be evident to all the lord is near he says so rejoice in the lord i will say it again rejoice don't be angry about this whole thing which has happened don't don't get very um, you know bad tempered about it have a godly attitude regarding this whole thing because the lord is near and he will come and he will judge so at that time he should find you having the right attitude standing firm in the lord rather than being led away um, so in that context he continue, he goes on to say do not be anxious about anything but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving present your requests to god so in this few verses he's kind of been focusing a little bit on eodia and syntax and their situation 
but now you know he broadens the uh, the the teaching to everyone because he says not don't be anxious about just this one particular issue in fact don't be anxious about anything so not just about you know disagreements in the church and how to resolve them in fact don't be anxious about anything but in everything you know go to god the lord will take care so rejoice in the lord i'm saying it again rejoice you know he says and let your gentleness be evident to all because the lord knows how to take care of our interests he knows what is best so he will if we if, if we allow him to lead and guide you no know, he will guide in the uh, right manner so yes in this particular case there was some conflict going on which probably was affecting the church but you know we of course are not facing those particular situations we may have many other things that we are concerned about so we too need to stand firm we stand firm in the resurrection power of jesus and we stand firm in carrying our cross and being like him in his death so in these two things we choose to stay stand firm so when these uh, situations come these difficulties come we don't get um, you know flustered we don't go into depression rather we choose to continue rejoicing not because there are supposed to be silver linings you know around clouds not because of any silly uh, you know a theory like that but because we have we are in the lord we choose to rejoice in him because he will take care of even this matter for us so we choose to stay gentle we choose to continue to be christ like in handling that particular situation and we go to him rather than being anxious we we go to him with prayer and petition trusting that he will help us in this matter so there are two words used over here rather than being anxious we are asked to do something else what are we supposed to do we are supposed to go to him with prayer and petition there are two i mean these are two different uh, greek words the first word prayer that's a very common uh, greek word for prayer uh, i have no clue how to pronounce it it's p r o s e u c h e prosush i suppose uh, so that would be your very common word for prayer it talks about you know prayer in general where you where people go and pray to god so rather than being anxious go to the lord in prayer and you also go to the lord in petition the second greek word is a stronger word it's a more intense word you know uh, like if someone is facing a crisis um and they are desperately crying out in prayer uh, that would be your word that would be the greek word it's it's the word d e e s i s uh, so go to the lord with prayer and go to the lord with d e e s i s petition um this word is uh, used very nicely in uh, james chapter 5 verse 16 which actually talks about prayer over there there's another word also for prayer mentioned but this word d e e s i s is also mentioned over there let's go to james chapter 5 um okay fine yeah we will not have time to do that now so yes we'll do it after we come back from the break but there are some good learnings that we can get you know for our practical christian walk from this passage so yes we'll we'll meet again after the break thank you